In this tutorial, we will look at um, various options for using plane stress elements in Abacus. And um, to get started, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time in class talking about various isoparametric plane stress elements. And um, these elements are available in both triangular and quadrilateral geometries to allow flexibility in meshing. Uh, we also talked about full integration and reduced integration, and both of these options are available. Um, and software like Abacus gives us several options for controlling spurious modes in reduced integration elements. In the following example, we will calculate the end displacement of an axially loaded bar using various 2D plane stress elements. So the objectives of this tutorial are to show how the, to control the, the selection of various 2D solid elements in Abacus, to show the effects of changing element types on the accuracy of the solution, to, and to illustrate how to apply a concentrated force in a solid element model using constraints. And specifically, we're just going to be modeling a bar under uniaxial state of stress. Um, the bar has length of 1200 inches and a depth of two inches uh, and a thickness of one inch. And the load P of 25 kips is applied Young's modulus is 15,000 KSI, and Poisson's ratio is 0.25. We can solve this problem analytically, just using principles of mechanics. And if we wanted to find the end displacement delta, it would just be PL over AE, which would give us one inch in this case. So we expect an end displacement of one inch, and uh, we'll see what we get when we model this using the plane stress elements. So we go into Abacus, and we start by creating a part. Um, this is a two-dimensional planar problem. Um, the type is deformable, and the base feature is shell. I'm just going to draw a rectangle that starts at the origin, and that has an opposite corner at coordinates 1200 and 2. And then I click done. And you can see there's my um, bar, which is much longer than it is uh, thick. For materials, we're given that the uh, problem is linear elastic, so we choose elastic properties. Young's modulus, we said, is 15,000. And Poisson's ratio, we said, is 0.25. And click OK. We also need to create a section. This is a solid section. Um, we could give it a name if we want to, but in this simple model, we don't really have too many sections that we have to define. So um, we'll just keep it as the default. And this is a homogeneous section. We click Continue. Um, we make sure that our material is selected here, and we give it a plane stress thickness of one inch, and we click OK. We expand the part under the model tree so that we can find the section assignments option. We double click on that. It asks us to select the region to be assigned a section. And I'm just going to select the whole model and click Done. And make sure that my section 1 is selected here. And then we click OK. One thing that we need to do, since we're still um, talking about the part here, is uh, if we zoom in um, using the box zoom view, and we zoom in on this right end here. Um, when I apply my concentrated force, if I'm applying it as a concentrated force, I would want to apply it right at the middle here. And so in order to do that, I have to partition this edge 
so that I have a node that's located right um, at the middle of, of that edge. So to do that, I have to go back to the part module. And um, under this button here, if I hold down on it and I go to the third button over on the right, it says partition edge, select midpoint. And so that's uh, the option that I'm going to use to partition. Okay. It says to down here in the dialog box, it says to select an edge to partition. So I want to partition this edge here. And it says to select a point on the edge. And I'm going to select the midpoint. And then I'm going to click create partition. And now you can see there's a big uh, yellow circle here, which is just indicating that there will be a node at this location that I can apply my concentrated force. Next, I need to create an instance of the part. I do this by double clicking on instances under assembly. And I'm just creating an instance of part one and I just click OK. And so now I have an instance of my part. I also need to create a step. And in this case, it's just a static analysis. I'm going to use a static general step. Um, I don't need to name it anything because we just have one step in this problem. Um, but we're going to insert the new step after the initial step. And we click Continue. And for the options with the step, we can just keep the default. Basically, it's a step that lasts one second. And we will ramp our load um, over that one second. Now we're ready to apply our boundary conditions and loads. So if I double click on boundary conditions, um, basically what I want is I want a displacement rotation boundary condition at the left side of the bar. So I'm going to click continue. And it's kind of hard to see in the model because um, the thickness is relatively small in comparison to the length. So again, I'm going to use this box zoom to zoom in on the left end of the bar. And it asks me to select the region for the boundary condition. And basically, I'm going to restrain the left end. So I'm going to select that entire edge, click Done. And I'm going to restrain it in both the x and the y directions. There's also this option to restrain rotation, UR3. Um, but just keep in mind that we're modeling this using solid elements that do not have rotational degrees of freedom. Um, and so if we do select that, Abacus is just going to give us a warning that it can't restrain that because it's not an available degree of freedom. OK, and now you can see that we have our x and y restraints. The other thing we need is we need to apply our load. Double click on load. And this is a concentrated force. So make sure you select concentrated force. And it's going to be applied in step one. I click continue. Now I got to zoom out and then zoom back in on the right side of my model. And it says to select the point uh, for the load. And we said that we were going to apply the load right here at the midpoint of this edge. We click Done. And the magnitude of that load is going to be um, 25 kips. And it's acting in the negative x direction. So I need to make sure that I put a minus sign here so that I get the direction right. And you can see that we do have a compressive load of 25 kips. Now we're at the point where we need to create a mesh. And this is where we will talk about the different options for um, controlling the mesh and defining the element type. So if we go back under our part 
and we double click on mesh. That will take us to the mesh module. And one thing we want to do is we want to go to the button that says assign mesh controls. And this is where you have the option to select between quadrilateral and triangular elements. The default is to use a mix of quadrilateral and triangular elements. I prefer to use just one type of element in my model. Um, and we're going to start with the quadrilateral elements. The other thing that uh, we have as an option is that if you have a pretty regular geometry, you can get by with a structured mesh. And what this will do is it'll create elements that are all nice rectangles as opposed to having um, some sort of distortion. So I'm gonna choose structured mesh and click okay. And you can see that my model turns green. So we're using quadrilateral elements. Let's now go to the button that says assign element type. It asks me to select the region of the model to be assigned an element type. I'm just gonna select the whole thing and click done. And we make sure that the plane stress element is selected. Um, over here on the left, we can choose between linear and quadratic elements. We'll start with the linear element first. And uh, again, here we have options for the quadrilateral element and the triangular element. Um, since we're using quadrilaterals, this is where we're gonna focus. And we have an option between using reduced integration and full integration. So if I select this box, then it's a reduced integration element. If I unselect the box, then it's a full integration element. Okay, let's keep it as reduced integration. And then let's look down in this box here. You can see there are various controls for the elements to control the various modes, like um, hourglass modes and things like that. Um, we're not going to do anything with changing these options. And I recommend that you don't change these options unless you really know what you're doing. So unless you have a reason to change these options, just keep it as the default. So for our first analysis, we're going to be using a four node bilinear plane stress quadrilateral with reduced integration and hourglass control. We'll go ahead and click okay. Now what I need to do is I need to seed the part. And I do this by clicking the button that says seed part. And for the size of the elements, I'm gonna make them one inch. And what that'll do is it'll give me two elements in the depth direction. So let's go ahead and click apply. You can see where the, the seeds are located. Um, then we go ahead and click mesh the part. And uh, you can see the mesh here. Okay, so it's nice structured mesh with quadrilateral elements. Um, and we're using the four node bilinear quadrilaterals with reduced integration. Now we're ready to submit the job. Let's create the job by double clicking on jobs and clicking continue and okay. And we go ahead and we submit the job. And I always like to pull up the monitor box to make sure there aren't any errors or warnings that are given um, from Abacus. And pretty quickly the analysis runs. So let's go ahead and see what our results look like. If I right click on my job and go to results, um, we can ignore this error. I'm not sure what this is, um, but it's just been popping up on my computer lately. Um, but what we want to look at is um, like the deformed shape. And we are also interested in looking at the, the stresses. Okay, let's look at the deformed shape first. And the default is to, um, to plot the deformed shape with a scale factor of uh, uh, this factor that's automatically computed by Abacus. So let's do the default first. And at first glance, it doesn't look like anything too exciting, um, but we're gonna zoom in here on this right edge. And 
and you can see that this is a pretty distorted shape here that's being plotted for the, the display shape. Um, and there are some um, displacements, that, like shapes of elements that look like um, they're exhibiting spurious modes. Um, we can change the scale factor by going to um, the plot options and choosing a uniform scale factor with a value of one. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us um, a, a one to one plot of the display shape. Um, so let's zoom out. Let's zoom back in on the edge here. And I'll zoom in again and you can see that you know we're applying this concentrated force here, um, and it is giving us some shapes that look like spurious modes. Now, Abacus has a, a stiffness that's built into the element that's controlling that, so that those um, spurious modes aren't dominating the response. But even still, we can see that um, that concentrated force is giving us some problems here. We can also look at the stresses. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. And you can see that we're getting some funny stresses that are developing here at the right end near where the load is being applied and near where we're getting those spurious modes. Okay, but if we look you know, down here, um, the stress is relatively uniform. Okay, so one thing we're gonna do is we're going to um, get that end displacement at the end of the bar, and then we're gonna save that and we're gonna compare it to the displacements um, that are calculated using different element types. So if I go to tools, Query, node, and then I select the end node. It gives me the displacement at the end of the bar. And this is at the, the mid depth of the bar. Um, so if I look down here in this uh, box, we get the coordinates for that point, we get the scale factor, we get the deformed coordinates, and then we also get the displacement. Um, and so this displacement in the x direction is the one that we're most interested in. Um, this is a displacement that's supposed to be one inch, and we're getting a value of 1.1 inches um, using this uh, four node element. Okay, so what I would do is I would copy that and then I paste it into this uh, table where I'm keeping track of all of my results here. Um, and so you can see that for the linear quadrilateral element with reduced integration, we observed spurious modes and we got a displacement of 1.1 inches. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the element type by going back to our model, going back to the mesh module and changing the element type. So we're gonna to go to assign element type, select the whole model, click done. And then instead of using reduced integration, let's see what happens if we use full integration. Okay, so I'm gonna uncheck, uncheck the reduced integration box. And now we have a four node bilinear plane stress quadrilateral that is using full integration. Um, now, full integration requires uh, more computational power than reduced integration, um, but it should correct the spurious modes that we observed. So let's go ahead and click OK. And then we also have to mesh the part again for the changes to take effect. And we click Yes. And so now we're using our full integration element. We submit the job again. We monitor the job for any errors and warnings.
and then we view the results. And we said we were going to plot the displacement. Um, let me zoom in on the right end of the bar, which is where we observed the spurious modes last time. Um, and let's just go undeformed shape. And then here's the deformed shape. And you can see that it doesn't look like there are any spurious modes. We could actually increase the scale factor if we wanted to, just to double check. Um, but I'm not going to do that here. The other thing we can look at is um, the, the stresses. And you see that we got rid of those weird bands of stresses at the edge of the bar, but you can see that we get localized stresses um, here at the point where we're applying this concentrated force. We can go to Tools, Query, Node, and we can query the displacement at this end node here. And you see that we get actually a much more accurate prediction of the displacement. So we get 1.001 inches, which is pretty close to one inch. And then we would store that in our table. Another thing you might be interested in doing is um, using the quadratic element and seeing um, how it performs. And to switch to the quadratic element, we just go back to the element type. We select our whole model, click done, and then we change the geometric order to quadratic. Now keep in mind that um, the quadratic element also is available in reduced integration, and we could also do full integration if we really needed it to. Um, and that we also have uh, controls um, to control the spurious modes. Um, this is, uh, down here, the summary is an eight node bi quadratic plane stress quadrilateral with reduced integration. And we click OK. And then we mesh the part. We submit the job again. We didn't get any errors or warnings. We view the results. And here's our deformed shape. We can zoom in on the right end. So here's undeformed, here's deformed, and you can see that the display shape um, makes sense for the problem that we're modeling. Um, we can also check the stresses. And again, we're still getting those stress concentrations at the location of the applied load. And the reason for that is because we are applying a concentrated force, like just a point load at this point. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to see uh, about how we can correct these stress concentrations at the point of the load. Um, one option is that we can distribute the load over the edge. Um, and that is, you know, if you think about the the scenario that you have in a lab when you're doing this experiment, a lot of times the load will be distributed over um, the edge as opposed to applied at, at a very single point. Um, and so regardless of what problem you're modeling, it's important for you to, to replicate what is going on in your model with what is going on in the experimental test. Um, okay, so how we fix that, we have two options. One option is to apply it as um, a distributed load along the edge. So we'll do that first. The other option is to use constraints to force this edge to move uniformly um, in the X direction. So we'll do that second. To apply the distributed load, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the load that I, my point load that I currently have, I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to choose suppress. What this does is it turns off the concentrated force, so it's no longer being applied in my model, but I haven't deleted the load. Um, and the reason that I don't want to delete the load is because I'm going to turn it back on when I use the constraints. I'm going to create a new load, which is going to be a pressure. And I'm going to apply that at the right edge. I got to zoom in just to make sure that I select the right part of my model. It says to select the surface for the load. Now I got to, because we partition this edge, I need to hold in on the shift key to make sure that I select both segments of the edge. And then I click done. And for the magnitude of this pressure, it's basically going to be force divided by cross-sectional area. And remember that our cross-sectional area is that the plate is two inches deep by one inch wide. Okay, so when it's all said and done, the pressure load that we're going to apply is going to be 12.5 kips per inches squared. And you can see that the loads are acting in the correct direction. So everything looks good. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my mesh. And for selecting the element type, I'm going to go back to the linear reduced integration element that gave us the problems with the spurious modes when we had the concentrated force applied. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And then I'll click uh, Mesh the part so that those changes take effect. And then I will go ahead and hit Submit. Let's view the results. Let's zoom in on the right edge here. And you can see that, you know, here's our um, undeformed shape. Here's the deformed shape. And you can see that we don't get any sort of um, spurious modes this time. And we can check the stresses. And the stresses are indeed uniform. Um, and the magnitude of the stress actually matches what it should be, um, which is 1,250. We can query the end displacement by going to Tools, Query, Node. And we select this point here at the end. And you can see that we get a displacement that is very close to the exact solution. Um, it's basically like 0.99999 um, inches, which is pretty close to one. And so by distributing the load over the edge of the, the bar, we have, or the edge of the plate, we've um, corrected the problem with the spurious modes and we've actually gotten a solution that's pretty accurate. So if we go back to our table, we're talking about this, um, this being our solution. Um, we didn't observe any spurious modes and there weren't any stress concentrations. Now there's another way to apply the, like to distribute the load over the edge. And that is to use a constraint to force the edge to move all the same displacement. Um, so let me go back to our model here. I'm going to turn off the pressure load by choosing suppress. 
and I'm going to turn the concentrated force back on by clicking resume. Okay, so we have that concentrated force that's being applied. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a constraint that basically forces this edge to remain straight. To do that, I go to constraints and I choose coupling constraint. I click continue. For the control points, I'm going to select the midpoint of the edge. And for the constraint region type, I'm going to choose node region and I'm going to select the rest of the edge. So this bottom and top, I'm holding in on the shift key as I click those and you can see that I've selected this entire edge. I click done. Um, with the kinematic coupling constraint, we can choose which degrees of freedom we want to constrain. Okay, basically what I want is I want for every point along this edge to move the same amount in the X direction. So I'm going to choose U1. I will allow U2 and UR3 to be unchecked. And uh, basically what that means is that um, if, if we have any sort of expansion in the Y direction, um, due to the Poisson effect, then th that will be allowed. We won't have any stress concentrations associated with it. Um, and my reason for unselecting UR3 is that um, we don't have rotational degrees of freedom activated in our model. So we go ahead and we click OK. And now this edge has a yellow line with a yellow circle indicating um, that we have a constraint that's defined there. Okay, so we have our concentrated force with the constraint. Um, we're using the, the linear quadrilateral elements with reduced integration. Let's go ahead and submit. On the monitor box, you can see that we do have a warning. Let's take a look at what that warning is. Um, basically, this is a default warning. Anytime you use a coupling constraint, um, they, they give you this warning that basically says that a translational degree of freedom um, at a node is constrained by kinematic coupling definition, then the translational degree of freedom for that node can't be included in any other constraints, including multipoint constraints, rigid bodies, etc. Okay, so we just, it's just a warning that says that um, we, we have to be careful with how we define constraints and so that we don't over constrain a particular node. Okay, so that means that our model ran successfully. Let's view the results. Here's undeformed, here's the deformed. We don't have any spurious modes. We look at the stresses. Stresses are uniform. Um, we use tools, query, and we query this node here at the edge. And you see that we get the exact same result as what we got um, when we used the pressure load. So it's, it has the exact same effect. It's just a different way of applying um, the force to the model. The last thing that we're going to do is to um, just change our mesh once again to see what happens uh, when we use triangular elements. Um, and so for the triangular elements, remember that we have to go to the mesh controls and switch from quadrilateral elements to triangular elements. And just like with the quadrilateral elements, the triangular elements also allow for us to use structured meshing. So we're going to keep that and click OK. Um, in our element type, we're now using plane stress elements that are linear. These are the three node um, 
triangular elements. Um, the triangular elements also have element controls associated with them. Um, and so those are things that if you want to read about, you can go to the Abacus help manuals to understand more about what these actually mean. Um, but basically we have a three node linear plane stress triangle. Okay, let's mesh the part. And you can see that with structured meshing, we get you know, a pretty uniform mesh. Um, let's go ahead and submit. Now keep in mind that I'm keeping that end constraint in place. Okay, so I'm not applying it as a concentrated force as I did in the first set of analyses that we did. Um, but nonetheless, we can look at the results. And we can look at the display shape. We can look at the stresses. The stresses are uniform because we aren't applying a concentrated force at a point and so forth. And then we could also query what is the magnitude of that end displacement if we wanted to. Okay, so this uh, table summarizes the results of the, the analyses that we did. Um, in general, triangular and quadrilateral elements can be used interchangeably. Um, your choice depends on the geometry that you are modeling. Um, also, linear and quadratic elements can be used interchangeably, but the elements converge at different rates and give different levels of accuracy in predicting the stresses. Um, they also require different levels of computational expense, and so your job as the analyst is to figure out like what is the optimal um, order of element for, you know, the problem that you're dealing with, um, and that gives you accurate answers, but also is computationally efficient. So, um, there's a, some trade-offs that, that go on. Um, the last piece of advice is to, um, not mess with the default element settings, unless you know exactly what you're doing, because you could be unintentionally, um, changing something that, um, has a significant effect on the accuracy of the solution. Okay, so that's uh, modeling with plane stress elements in Abacus. Um, so uh, good luck with creating your own models. Thank you.